All right, everyone. So, fintech, angel or demon? So, before we start this, um, we may say things which don't want to be heard outside of this stage. So, we do have holy water for anyone who sins on saying things that are not technically allowed. So, I will be pushing both of them to say things which are easy to say and things which are harder to accept. My name is Janusz Barberis, I'm going to be the moderator, and I'm going to take the stage saying that fintech for startups is now dead. There is no such thing as a fintech startup industry. So saying this, what do you think, first you, Rebecca, and then after? Um, hi, guys. I was working previously for the Monetary Authority of Singapore, the regulator, financial regulator in Singapore. I spun out my team about a year ago. We now run a think tank um, that helps connect uh, public and private sector around financial services development. So I absolutely cannot say fintech is dead. I also run the Singapore Fintech Festival, which is 60,000 people that descend on Singapore once a year to talk about fintech. So I think 60,000 people would disagree with you there, Yana. So are you saying that you're becoming an angel of fintech and you are spreading the wings to protect all the ecosystem? Of course, yeah. I mean, it's no wonder why we're, why we're dressed like that. She in white and me in black. So angels and demons, that's obvious, right? Um, yeah, I tend, to, I tend to disagree also with Janos that Vintek is dead. It's not dead yet, I would say. But it's, it's, it's going there, I think. So what do you think, because uh, you're wearing black, so the, the demon of Vintek, what, what would you name a demon of Vintek to be? Well, I think there are so many demons that it's hard to find an angel these days. <laughs> yeah, I mean, starting from BNPL, um, all the way to, to mm, crypto. So from that perspective, um, there are just few angels and much more demons in fintech. Uh, although they did a, a good job in democratizing uh, 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 financials for all, because banks were really untouchable back then. Uh, now it has changed, but I think fintech ate its own tail to a certain extent. One second. So you're saying like crypto is a demon, but I remember how Cryptocurrency was here to save the world, make things better, take away the bad banks. So it, why, why do you say that It did save crypto? the world, didn't it? Oh, I'm sorry, it didn't. So anything specifically about cryptocurrency that you think was very negative? I mean, uh, the idea in itself and the technology underlying, I like it very much. Yeah, But uh, just like with every hype, and to be honest, I'm expecting this to happen with uh, AI and large language models and stuff like that, there were... Um, uh, lots of uh, bad actors there, which kind of spoiled um, the whole crypto world, and it's pretty hard to 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 like get cleared out of that out of that thing. So currently, I don't. I mean, that's that's obvious because we have now the the, the bear market lasting for like months and months, uh, and. I mean, I guess everybody hopes still the big money is in, in crypto and, and um, it will change most probably after every bear market, bear market, it's a bull market. But still, I think there's lots of work to be done to, to uh, get cleared out of FTX, FTXs of this world and, and, and such guys, yeah? All right, so, so coming back now on the, on the angel side, so Rebecca, what do you think are angel moments of, of fintech or what are the angels for the industry? I've dressed wrong, I think, for this session. I think that the, one of the angels of fintech is its ability to keep reinventing itself. So we started, I think when you're getting out, is fintech dead? Fintech became tech fin, tech fin became web three. Now I'd say, particularly in Asia, it's all about reg tech and soup tech, which is ultimately then selling fintech to governments and to regulators and central banks. Um, so it, it has the ability to constantly evolve itself. So I would say it's very much alive and kicking. So it's interesting. So what you're saying is when maybe five, six years ago, the majority of fintech startups would look at governments and saying, you are killing us with the regulation, you are killing us with the process. Now the same governments are supporting, enabling those founders. Do, do you have some example where governments or government infrastructure play has worked as angels for B2B entrepreneurs and fintech startups? There's a few countries in the world that have built national payment systems which enables you to do peer-to-peer -peer transfer of payments for no cost at all. So Singapore is one example. We have a national identity scheme, SingPass, and then we have PayNow, which is our payment system. 
India has the same with um, Aadhaar as the identity layer, and then UPI as the payments layer. Brazil has the same thing with PIX. Um, and by providing this infrastructure as kind of free, completely free payments, it's possible then for entrepreneurs to build on top of that value-add services. In Brazil, you can now do lending, point-of-sale lending on top of this national payment infrastructure. So I think there are some great examples where governments are starting to catch up and actually become customers um, for fintechs. There's another example that I shared yesterday um, called Project Bakong, which is um, a retail CBDC project in Cambodia. So Cambodia didn't set out to build a CBDC. They didn't really know what they had been building, to be honest. They approached the Singapore government. I was working there at the time and went to a, pro went to a um, delegation to Cambodia to look at what they'd been building. Basically, they tried to build a real-time, or they put out an RFP for a real-time payment system vendor. And the cheapest vendor that came back happened to be a blockchain company from Japan. So what they ended up with, with trying to build a real-time payment system, was a retail CBDC um, that they now offer throughout Cambodia. It has 200,000 users, which is small, but it's a small country. Um, and they've accidentally ended up with a leapfrogging fintech Web3 solution that otherwise wouldn't exist. So just before going back to the audience and talking about another demon, um, buy now, pay later. Who here knows about buy now, pay later? Raise your hand. Okay, so keep, okay, so now raise your hand if you think buy now, pay later is a demon. Okay, and raise your hand if you think it's an angel. Okay, so it's not, not quite 50-50. So um, what's your view? Angel or demon? Buy now, pay later. Um, currently a demon, for sure. Um, but I think um, to come back to a previous question on the regulators, uh, it's an increasing, uh, 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 we see an increasing attempt to regulate BNPL more. And again, coming back one step, I mean, coming one step back regarding regulators, I think you shared with us uh, fascinating statistics yesterday uh, when you said that the um, e-money uh, license in the UK uh, the, the statistics says that only, what, 7% or 7%? So, please share it with us. So yeah. now they, so it was interesting talking of regulators being angels. Uh, regulators have supported the rise of the fintech industry, especially in the UK. And one of the most common element was electronic money license. 70% of applicants used to get an electronic money license from the FCA in the UK five, six years ago. Now it's 7%. So they decreased by 10 times the amount of license being issued. So now it means that regulators, as far as the UK is concerned, is cracking down on fintech subs trying to acquire it. So here yeah, that's it went also, from... That's also sending a, a message of sorts, right? Do they feel it's, they, they need to regulate it more or they were too liberal in the past or maybe they think fintech as we, as we know it is that as well, right? But coming back to BNPL again, uh, why I think it's, it's on the demon side, um, well, we all know that on the BNPL side, the uh, interest rates are actually quite high, bordering with, you know, loan, loan sharks. Um, I don't want to enter the discussion uh, about the morality of uh, interest rate A uh, as opposed to the interest rate B, because this will lead us into an ethical discussion and we don't want to burden the audience with that kind of, uh, of talk. But still, I think uh, there preying on uh, uh, BNPL companies, preying on, on this current zeitgeist where um, I need to, uh, when I see something on a social network or in the shop or, or if it's served to me through a commercial, I need to have it just right now, immediately. I need to have it without thinking how will I afford it? How could I afford it? There was an interesting thing. It's a video actually I saw this morning when I, when I got up. There was a story of Burger King in the US when Burger King started to accept credit card as a way of payment for food, and you had the majority of the people in the Burger King who said, well, if you can't afford a burger with cash, you shouldn't be using a credit card for it. And now we know how credit card is coming in. So there might be an element of also acceptance, and that's morality and habits. And I'll show that video. It was, it was Burger King promoting the acceptance of credit card and the backlash you had about that notion of why should you spend $2 on a credit card as opposed to $2 in your, in your pocket? But talking about, you said about morality, for example. And I know yesterday we talked a little bit about 
Islamic finance, for example, and how here it's embedded into the financial product because of the country. So I don't know if you want to start talking about, for example, Islamic finance and why you think it's an angel of, of fintech. Yeah, I, I, I haven't been in touch that much with Islamic banking, to be fully honest with you, because in the region where I operate, uh, we don't really have Islamic banking, so I'm sure that Rebecca knows more about it. Uh, the, um, we basically agreed yesterday that uh, there's a growing middle class in, in, in Muslim countries and they want, to, uh, um, they want to have the mature financial instruments which are growing within the boundaries of Islamic banking, right? Yeah, I think we're starting to see a huge growth in Islamic financing across Southeast Asia, Malaysia leading the way, and then, of course, from the Middle East. I think the conversation yesterday, we were trying to assess whether that counted as some form of mora mora adding morality into financial services, when in reality it's just a new customer segment that's reaching middle class that therefore is probably worth serving. So it kind of takes away that morality question, sadly, and probably doesn't address it in the same way. I guess, though, the broader morality piece around fintech is it's finding a need that exists that isn't otherwise being solved for and trying to address it. So. The reason why you're in fintech to start with is you tried to build a bank because you couldn't open a bank account, right? So there's needs in financial services. We can all see where there are gaps from the traditional system, whether that's because of the regulation and licensing or because banks have a monopoly um, where we would all like better solutions. So maybe you should share about your starting a bank story. Well, I started a bank from, it was a different point, but it was about, um, about seven, eight years ago. I, I came out of university and I felt that I was cheated by the financial system because I did all those great studies to never got a job into a bank. And then I saw all the people my age and my generation that had their future life outcome written off because it was an economic crisis caused by the bank. And I wanted to rebuild finance and therefore it led to building a bank, build, led to building an accelerator in fintech too have a new wave, but that was the interesting element is I think when you see how the fintech startups that have emerged out of 2010, even though it was a social crisis, it didn't make them very social fintechs. Payments, lending, some of the biggest valuation in the startup ecosystem, asset management, robo-advisory, there is very limited amount of social benefit from that. But actually, you, Rebecca, were on a panel yesterday talking about bootstrapping of selling the future growth, right? Unpaid POC, angel or demon? Absolute demon. Um, I think in one of the demons of fintech and financial services is the sales cycle to sell, particularly B2B fintech. So to sell into a financial institution can take 18 months to two years, would you agree? Something like that. And in that time period, you obviously can die if you don't have funding. And I think the stat is something like 20% um, of POCs and financial services actually pay the startup for delivering that pilot, that POC, um, whether or not you get the contract at the end of it. I think we're moving slightly beyond that. It's starting to become a bit easier as banks get their procurement processes sorted out. There are now sandboxes that exist that means you can test APIs. Um, and connectivity on synthetic data so that you know, it's a safe environment before you implement with a bank. But it still is not the easiest industry to sell into for licensing reasons and for the, the monopoly of the banks. And I think on, on you, because you know, you, you've known Norwegian quite a lot and you've invested and worked in them, financial inclusion, I think it's a very hard one not to agree that it's an angel element. But do you think it should be the role of a startup or the role of a government? Where, where do you see who should now be the real angel for all those people in emerging markets? Well, um, those companies are basically filling the gap uh, that's existing out there because the, the, the government and the commercial banks are not trying to, to, to fill that gap because uh, there are, there's no resources or there's no money or there's no interest, financial interest on behalf of the commercial banks to, to cover that. Uh, so uh, it just, uh, uh, again, they're filling the gap because they could, yeah? Yes, this should be the, the, the task of the governments, but it's, I mean, we're not living in a Disney world, right? Where does venture capital come in, right? So the wolf of Wall Street, you know, greed is good, high roller, high valuation. Venture capitalists, 
Angel, demon, how do you, how do you look at oh, this? Oh, absolutely demons. I mean, I hate this greed is good thing. Although I'm trying to raise That's VC because fund, but, This is yeah. because you're an angel investor. <laughs> and fundraising, if anyone and wants to. And fundraising currently, yeah. Uh, I mean, I would like to uh, introduce a bit more of a morality to that um, industry. Um, yeah, it sounds like a moonshot, sure, but starting from our own experience, um, you know, learning by doing, I guess. How, how would you bring morality on the investment side within fintech? What, what would you practically do? I wouldn't, I wouldn't invest into gambling, for instance. I wouldn't uh, 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 invest in some industries that I might feel um, are not, at least to my, to my own personal sense of morality. Yeah? I, I, I don't think I would invest into BNPL. To be honest, and, and you, Rebecca, how, how do you see, you know, the the invest, investment landscape in in Asia? Who are the one supporting startups? Or do you think, you know, down the line, getting paid revenue and client paying for you is the best way moving forward? The venture capital scene in Southeast Asia, particularly, is not as developed as the U.S. or Western Europe, where this greed sort of mentality probably exists in a bigger way. Western Europe. Western Europe. I did say, yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. I think funds there are a much smaller size. They're only maybe second or third round that they're you know raising for at the moment. So it's still developing which means you have much more of a community-centered angle to it. I think it's less greed-focused. But ultimately, the big buyers in Asia are the banks, um, maybe even the tech companies versus the fintechs. I shared an anecdote yesterday about um, an interview I did recently with Eduardo Saverin, who's the co-founder of Facebook. He's based in Singapore, and he's now uh, the managing partner of B Capital, which is a billion-dollar fund in Asia. Having said there weren't many big funds, this is one growth fund that does exist. And his whole message is around um, if he were to build Facebook today, how he would do it differently or whether he would even do it to start with. Because when he started out with Mark Zuckerberg, if they could realize what they were building at that point and the negative impact it would have on the world, he wouldn't have done it. I think that's easy to say in hindsight. He also is not the founder of Facebook. You know, I had to explain who he was. No one really knows Eduardo Saverin, so maybe that's part of it. But it does mean now in the companies that he invests in, there is an element of trying to inject morality with the founders to think about, you know, we've heard on a few times on this stage for founders looking at that unicorn status further down the line, like from day one, you need to believe in yourself and that you're going to hit that vision. So then you should already be thinking about if I do hit that goal, what are the implications that could extend from that? What, what are the, what's the damage? What's the negative externalities of what I'm working on, as well as what would be positive for the world? I think that is an important mindset, an interesting one to work into your business. But I think it's easier to say in hindsight, for sure. You're not going to... It's a hard morality question to say, would you turn down funding or would you turn down finding your product market fit? Because in 10 years' time, it might have multi-billion users and be a problem. And it's... it's Whenever you aim to, to run a global business, I guess it's to a certain extent like opening a Pandora's box. You never know when you will end up. So, I mean, coming back again to the morality question, I would invest in, into a defense company knowing that in 10 years from now it can be misused. But that's really a personal point of view. So, so, so looking forward, and so we still have about 10 minutes, and if you have questions to ask, start getting ready, and we'll, we'll take the question in about five minutes, so start thinking. So looking forward, when, uh, when we got introduced by Nick, my, my opening line was, fintech burst has been bigger than the dot-com burst back in the 2000s. Um, the stock market and the collapse of share price of 80, 90% of fintech companies, Appium being one, Stripe being another, do you think this was a demon or do you think this was an angel? Do you think that destroying so much shareholder value is hurting founders or is showing founders a big reality check that is positive for them? How do you look at this? The recent crash of the fintech market publicly and privately, was this a demon moment or an angel moment? I think it was an angel moment uh, if we want to really you know, split it. Uh, into two completely separate boxes. Um, yes, the valuations were overblown by far. 
And uh, coming back to the discussion, uh, bootstrapping or, or future growth, I mean, uh, you know, having a valuation of 33 billion for a for, um, company that has 20 million customers, uh, when will it pay off ever? I don't think so. So it's getting more, uh, much more healthier than it was, than it used to be. Um, I think this would change, this would start growing, but not, not all those companies. Some companies we saw failed big time, yeah? Uh, so yes, this, this was maybe not really an angel moment, but rather a, 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 a fresh, you know, bucket, a bucket of fresh water in the face. I completely agree. I think it's a help, helpful reset on the industry. I think we did share when we were talking yesterday that B2C fintech does feel like it's dead. There's less opportunities there, and the market reset has impacted that. Growing on, you're not happy about that. I'll give you a chance to respond in a second. Um, but the banks are still there, and they've still got a shitload of money. So there are still exits that can be made, good exits. And I think a good strategy in fintech is to look for M&A, whether they're buying you to acquire your talent or actually your business um, or your license, as it may be. Um, there's still enough interest there. And, and I think it's actually a good point because I remember seven, eight years ago, we were talking about banks as the devil, um, as a thing that was stifling innovation. And now we don't necessarily need to say that the banks are the angels, but they have either acquired startups, they have acquired hired founders, they have distributed at scale a certain level of innovation. I never thought seven years ago I would be now saying this. But I think it's important to re-challenge yourself on where is the state of the industry going forward? So, so we talked about the dot-com burst, but the dot-com burst also gave us Facebook, Amazon, Google, and then in Asia, you had the Baidu's and the, the Alibaba's of the world and the Tencent's. So if you were to look forward and you had some FinTech entrepreneurs, either 2.0, they're restarting their company, or 1.0 is they now want to go into building their new company, what do you think the opportunity should be ahead of them in terms of doing finance for good now that we have the chance of restarting that fintech industry with a new generation of startup founders? So either of you want to start first on what is the next big positive social change opportunity so that when we come back on this stage next year, Nick, uh, we are able to say here are the proper angels of fintech. I think... Governments are now customers. Just to reiterate that point, that there is, there has been a shift where, when we look at financial inclusion, it's not just the entrepreneur that's going in and trying to find an address for more market. Governments are putting real money behind supporting these projects taking place. They're also building the infrastructure, as I said earlier, that you can build on top of. So, there's a lot more opportunity now to do good while making money. Aradian is a good example about that. Of that, Antonio was speaking about it yesterday. But then I do think. The dot-com companies that we'll start to see now are probably still in spaces that you'd think would be addressed by now, but still aren't. Like payments still is a huge, it's all about the margins and there's still huge margin to be made. So there's an opportunity there. Um, some other examples, Token 2049 was last week in Asia, which is a big crypto conference. There seems to be a, a lot more building around consumer apps again in DeFi. So there's almost, now that the technology is there, maybe there is the opportunity to go into that space, although that's probably a bit further out. So I think there's governments as customers, there is still traditional kind of boring world stuff that needs addressing and payments. And then we're gonna see a lot more happening in Web3. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, I think um, B2C has lost its appeal, or if you want to put it differently, it's uh, the, the, the playing field has been saturated. Uh, but there's still lots of spaces in uh, B2B fintech, in B2G fintech, as you correctly pointed out. Uh, and I also think that uh, maybe it wouldn't be easy to build a fintech on a global scale, but there are still lots of pockets of opportunity, so to speak, uh, for even B2C fintech uh, in Southeast Asia, in Africa, in Latin. Um, there are still uh, big countries who are... Um, terribly, terribly uh, um, underfinanced, I mean, uh, um, fin from the financial perspective, unbanked, really. So um, we have to aim to, to, to bring the level of financial inclusion and literacy in those countries, in those areas, to, to, to 
like at least 60, 70 percent. And then, I mean, uh, it's lots of lots of business for everybody there. Uh, and once we get there, then we could think of a more more you know fair global uh, uh, um, solution if you want. Um, and what you mentioned earlier when we were discussing Janos, uh, this fourth wave of, of fintechs, we shouldn't underestimate the new rulers of fintech big fours, uh, fintech Google, um, Facebook, Google, uh, Amazon. So they're uh, they're becoming. Mm -mm -mm. They're getting there. They're they're in charge actually right now. It's just a question of time when they will be present with their financial uh, uh, solutions everywhere. So, um, so as we take a question from the audience, and if you ask your question before, I will give one example of an angel or a demon. If it's demonish, don't worry. We have the water to absolve you from your sins. So that's going to be totally fine. But actually, what you mentioned about the angel element, and as people are getting ready. I think angel investment in pocket of geographical differentiator will give a lot of space for angel investors to come in, whereas the ventures capital won't get the scale, but the financial return still will be quite positive. So I, I totally agree. Is there any questions here um, that wants to challenge anyone or you want to give an example of angel or demon in the fintech industry? Or you can also say a government, for example. So it can be a government, a bank, a startup, or a big tech. And Facebook is too easy to say that it's a demon, by the way. They have enough on their plate. So, anyone? No? So, go ahead. Goran, I feel like you should explain your view on buy now, pay later, because it's completely different to what we've just spoken about. Well, maybe not. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, I, I know the, the panelists, so I can be a little more liberal with my questions or comments, but uh, the whole fintech thing being dead, it's, I mean, come on, it's... Um, it's a staple of the economy for it's happening for the last 10,000 years of traders of goods and services. So whenever the governments introduced IOU notes, whenever the government supported them, whenever the coins were issued, that's all called fintech, technology of that time. So now we're talking about technology of this time. Um, so yeah, I don't think it's that. It's just a, it, as long as there is economy, as long as there is a change of uh, goods and services, fintech will continue, or the companies will try to improve those processes going forward. Uh, going forward. And for that reason, B2C is not that, maybe it's saturated at this moment, but when you zoom out just a little bit in 10 years time, I think there is gonna be another wave of innovation and think, uh, because it, it is a staple of the uh, economy. Um, yeah, I, I was listening to all of that. I was listening to Bojidar and uh, uh, Bojidar and I worked together as well. So he was saying so many things that I have to doubt the, the, the loyalty of where we come from, especially the, for example, buy now, pay later, you know. Um, I have been fortunate enough to be part of Afterpay, the Australian buy now, pay later, which from the almost early days. Uh, so I kind of disagree with the statement of uh, interest rates and all that. It's a free product if you use it smartly, wisely. And the companies are actually, in, well, we did at Afterpay. We actually implemented a lot of, there is no due date. There is a due period. If you do pay, we, we, we extend the thing, extend the payment time in terms and all of that. So I think um, there has been, by now, Pelera was so successful that they opened the market for a bunch of new players and uh, those late adopters actually kind of spoiled the game for everybody else in terms, in terms of their reputation. So I have my questions about that uh, as well, but it was definitely an interesting discussion. So um, good, yeah. good job. And kind of like what we were saying is like, you know, it's in French you have an expression which is le roi est mort, vive le roi. The king is dead, long live to the king. And I think it's exactly the same thing in FinTech. There's a wave of FinTech that has died and there's gonna be a new wave immediately there because digital finance won't stop. We need finance, we are in a tech world. And from that perspective, there will be continuity. The question is, who are the new king makers in, in that industry? So we have one minute to go. Um, what do you want people to remember Apart from asking for one more question, do you want to ask it? Sorry, um, one more question. So, I have a uh, startup that's selling educational toys for kids. I have been selling it online for like six years now. I've been blocked by PayPal three times. I've been blocked by Stripe two times. I've been blocked by Shopify payments once. Mercury, you know, this neo bank has closed our bank account for a single day when the war in Ukraine started, probably because they miss you know, understood Croatia for Ukraine or something like that. My question would be, like, what is your opinion on regulation when it comes to fintech, when it comes to all these payment processes? I kind of have a feeling that it's becoming 
like worse and worse and that you know there are just these algorithms just banning you know um, Shopify merchants, people doing e-commerce and stuff like that. You know, it has become so bad that it's even a meme. You know, you stop drop shipping, you get banned by PayPal like a week later or something like that. So what's your opinion on regulation and, you know, those kinds of things? Perhaps e-commerce, let's just narrow it down. Sure, we'll take it. Madam regulator. <laughs> well, I'll get Rebecca out of this one. I think uh, a real demon in whatever you do, whether it's a fintech industry, you have people, process, and paper. And I think sometimes it's not about regulation, it's literally about an idiot that doesn't understand a process, and then a bank just automatically blocks people. I think it's bad process, bad paper, and bad people which are killing something like this. Regulators do have a bad press, but I think in those automated rules and account shutdown, it's really bad internal processes more than it is bad regulation. They're just covering their ass as opposed to thing. And I think those people are more demonish than Sometimes what the angel of the purpose, like you entrepreneurs, building businesses and help essentially kids and education system. Yeah, I think, I think regulators are necessary. Uh, and they're there. Uh, uh, I would like to see them uh, more proactive than reactive, which is currently the case in most of the countries. Singapore is definitely a, a very bright uh, example of a proactive regulator, that's for sure. Uh, yeah, and I'm Singapore. not saying it because of Rebecca, but I mean, they really are. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, regulation is often considered as, as, as an excuse for not doing something. Like, oh no, we cannot do that because of GDPR. Uh, we cannot do that because of PSD2, because of, you know, Basel 2 without actually understanding what it's all about. Regulation is there actually to enable things and to control, not to control, but to... Um, uh, help out the economy, to help out the, 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 the end clients, to help out companies that should be, they should feel uh, uh, safe within this, you know, wild seas of fintech. I have a feeling that, you know, like all these uh, companies, when they become as big as like Stripe or PayPal, sometimes it's easier for them to just like block merchants with some kind of an automated, you know, AI tool, which is just, you know, a big if statement. Uh, rather than, you know, just, you know, talk to the people understanding the issue. I mean, the same thing is happening when they block, in example, Facebook pages for advertising and stuff like that. But anyways, so uh, back to your panel. Yeah, sorry. Well, uh, we're now slightly over time. So if you want to continue this very religious discussion about fintech angel and demon, please do this. We'll stay over there. In the meantime, thank you very much for the stage. Thank you to both our amazing panelists. And uh, for anyone... Have a wonderful rest uh, for the conference.